Psycho Killer, Keska Say. I'm going to listen to wrestling, <laughs> stick to wrestling all day. Can't even get that one out right. Hello, my name is John McAdam, and welcome to the only wicked good wrestling podcast out there, Stick to Wrestling. Sure, there are some good wrestling podcasts out there, but are they wicked good? No. Give us 60 minutes every week, and perhaps, indeed, we will give you a raw bone wrestling podcast. And with that, I want to bring in my convivial co-host, Sean Goodwin. Sean, I want you to hard sell these people on our Facebook page. Well, I mean, I just, you know, you just, what else can we give you? I mean, you know, it's all free. It's all awesome. And uh, this is what you missed this week. Who did Bob Backlund beat 40 years ago? What was Ken Patera's issue with George Scott? Did Art Anderson get drop kicked during a tornado warning? <laughs> Kamala too is who? Does the old Mid Atlantic U.S. belt look awesome or terrible? I have like awesome. completely switched. Yeah, I have completely switched. But there is, there is. You would not think this is like. By the way, this is as close to an argument as we get. Is whether or not the U.S. belt looks good from the old, you know, blackjack mulligan days. Uh, did Condry and Hickerson wish us a merry Christmas? Why is Don Amici grilling the fabulous Mula? All that John's daily results from across the world are new YouTube clips that Lou superbly puts together. Old school videos, clippings, pictures, what else could you possibly want? And it's all free and a bunch of great guys. Speaking of the great guys, we don't do this all the time, but we're going to make an – John and I talked about this. We're going to make an exception this time. Our buddy Bo James coming up on uh, December 25th at the Model City Event Center, 201 East Center Street over in Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, we'll be having a card for uh, um, for Hunger First will be the charity. So if you are in the neighborhood, please bring canned foods. You will see um, Misty James, both significant other, in a, her uh, last match. Uh, you have a Southern States title match, Ray Idol and the Me- Mega Destroyer. And uh, Bo and uh, Wayne Atkins against the Hawks. And what I just noticed, who else is going to be here uh, wrestling? Dawn Wright. Yes, that Dawn Wright, the the uh, the uh, one half of the legendary Wright brother tag team. So I mean, so yeah, if you get over there to help out Bo, and because uh, he's doing God's work, we always say we love the old school stuff, and Bo's out there doing it. He certainly is, and yeah, Bo's a friend of the show, and I hope that show does well. Good luck to Misty in her in her last match, and also you brought up the YouTube channel. I want to publicly thank Jake Hamar for doing the artwork on that. Jake the Valentine Hamar. Um, you know, one other thing, really quick. I used to listen to Dave Milter's Iata show like every day. It was part. Yep. Of my weekday, I would at least listen to the first 30 minutes. I mean, no questions asked. And usually I would listen to the guest. And I hope I hope your relationship, you the listener, your relationship with Stick to Wrestling is just like that. I hope it's part of your week and I hope you enjoy it. But anyway, our next review of a year, 1994. What's 1994 known for? The Blue Album, O.J. Simpson allegedly killing a bunch, couple of people. Uh, Pulp Fiction, you, the first Terrible UFC. Wrestling. Who? Terrible wrestling. Oh, I was going to get to that. And then there's the bad part. Like, there's no World Series. Uh, Co- Kurt Cobain combed his hair with a, a 38. And the, the wrestling stunk. And we're going to talk about that. It's not going to be a 55 or 60 minute, you know, bitch fest about wrestling, but we're going to call it like it is. And we're going uh, to use the uh, Wrestling Observer Newsletter and the Pro Wrestling Illustrated uh, Awards as kind of a backdrop for this. And Sean, I would like to start by talking about Wrestler of the Year. And by the way, there's no way we're going to get through all of these, but that's okay. Um, let's look at, at the Wrestling Observer. Now, this show. It's. I used to love Japanese wrestling in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Mexico, not as much, but let's look at Wrestler of the Year for 1994. Toshiaki Kawada, one Wrestler of the Year. Number two, and it was close, was Sabu. And that, I don't know when that started sounding crazy, but it really didn't sound crazy in 1994. Sean, what was your reaction to that? I don't like Sabu. I didn't like Sabu then, and I watched all. I watched a lot of ECW. I got my ECW stuff from you, so um, I, I watched a lot of ECW back then. And uh, okay, I don't, how many times do I have to watch? Uh, he was new. This was 1994, and this was kind of his first exposure, big time. You know, outside of 
people who saw him in Japan and in the indie circuit. When he started hitting ECW, this was like, you know, they would do the stuff like have him uh, have 911. <laughs> yeah, we're getting him in a minute. And by the way, you said this was going to be a 55 minute bitch fest. Okay, 52. <laughs> this is this is not very in the Christmas spirit of you, John. 1994. Uh, so, uh, 25 years ago. This you remember when we were talking about 1989, where we said a revolt in wrestling is coming quickly. Um, Here it I, is. Yeah. Sabu is basically a middle figure because he he was different and that was it. But oh my God, no one missed more spots. And then he did him again. He would do the same spot again. What, what did the wind that, like, he, as he went flying by and missing the guy, did the wind knock him out to keep him standing there for another 10 minutes while Sabu sets up the table again? Oh, he was terrible. The fact that he's too – he was even considered too as terrible. I mean, you know what, though? I, I'm being totally honest. Like, when I first saw that in 94, I was a little bit surprised, but I wasn't offended by it. I mean, it just – goes to show you how hot he was in 1984 i mean it and if i got a tape of a show from battle creek michigan or from san jose california that they flew sabu in and there was a sabu match on it i mean there was a demand for that tape i would vote for 2019 rick flair over 1994 sabu and for some reason, 1994 Ric Flair is below Sabu. I, I can't see how you could – he'll have a couple good, good spots, but I mean I don't – I just never saw it. I, like I said, I watched a lot of that product back then because I was part of that revolt. And when I saw – not as much Smoky Mountain because I just didn't have it in the area. But ECW, we did. It looked back. It does not age well. This was – they got a lot of awards here, not necessarily deservedly. This really wasn't their great year. Their great year was coming up uh, in 1995. But I mean, you, there was definitely it was more interesting. It was he highly flawed, but it was much more interesting than anything the other guys were putting out. Oh, uh, for sure. I mean, and you're right. This is when a lot of you know hardcore fans. These are the people who subscribe to the Observer. I mean, this is the wrestling that, that you know the the WWF they had been completely turned off by WCW they be, they were completely turned off by by this point we'll get more on that in a minute um you, you know i mean yeah this was it was basically disenfranchised wrestling fans from the 80s who couldn't stand the turn that the wrestling business had taken and, okay, so th as we talk about this, I basically we have them kind of side by side. So we're gonna, but so we're gonna discuss them, but discuss them in, as you like to say, that category. A quick aside. Now you're a voter, right, for the uh, the Wrestling Observer Hall of the uh, for the uh, the awards. Yeah, anyone who was a, a subscriber could vote, and I voted. I'm almost positive I voted this year. I voted almost every year. How the hell long does it take? I mean, is it something like you have to break it up into half-hour segments each day? There's like 500 awards. <laughs> I mean, I remember one time I was working in a place where there wasn't too much work to be done. And it took me a long time because not only did I put in a vote, but I would like write you know, a, a description or whatever. I, I would add comments to my vote. So that one took a while. I do remember that. And I mean, I think it was the 89 yearbook. I practically wrote the thing. And I, when I put this together, I just kind of just cut paste and put it in one uh, one thing. 21 pages. The thing is 21 pages long of just like, you know, WON award categories. Nothing else. So that's kind of this is this is an ordeal, I guess. I mean, I guess so. I think I mean, at some point, uh, well, Dave stopped doing the yearbook after 90 and he just put it in the in the issue. Now, let me go over. I'll I'll include um, U.S. and Canada only. I will. So I'll take out. So number one is Sabu. Number two is Ric Flair. We're talking 1994 Ric Flair here. Number three is Shawn Michaels. Uh, who's actually a really good candidate. Number four is Bret Hart, who's actually a really good candidate. Number five is 1994 Terry Funk, who people were saying was too old in 1989. He retired in 1989 and then came back five years. Well, he, he was running independent shows and everything, but he was working not full time, but at least he was on a major, major star on TV for ECW. Um, 
Let me see. Number six is Vader. Number seven is Shane Douglas, your pal. And that's it. Everyone else is either a Japan or Mexico based wrestler. That includes Steve Williams. He didn't wrestle much in the United States. Now compare that to the Pro Wrestling Illustrated list. Hulk Hogan is number one. He's not even listed in the Observer. Number two is Bret Hart. Number three is Razor Ramon, and number four is Ric Flair. Sean, you groaned upon hearing the name Hulk Hogan. Okay, we have gone to the point where, well, Hulk still has it. And, you know, you know as we got into the 80s, well, he's still pretty, you know, he still kind of had that thing. No, this was a complete re- Rebellion at this point. He tried to roll out the old yellow and red routine, and it was not working. No, it wasn't. And you know what? I'm going to take a step back. Here's how we got here. 1992, Hulk Hogan is still by far the most popular, the the biggest superstar and the best draw on the WWF's roster, right? However, the company, he has a steroid scandal, and the entire company has a steroid scandal, so they sent him home. Uh, They actually had an interview with Vince McMahon on primetime wrestling, and it was kind of, okay, Hulk, see you later. You know, they, they made it clear that Hulk was going away for a while. I thought for a while was going to mean, you know, probably make a cameo at uh, SummerSlam and then, you know, wrestle again at Survivor Series. No, they kept him away for a good eight or nine months. Then they brought him back to wrestle in WrestleMania 9. It was him and Bruce Beefcake against Ted DiBiase and Mike Rotundo as Ernar Scheister. Um, so he's getting a tag match at WrestleMania, but it was the match that got the most eyeballs. And they did a really good angle with it where the heels beat up Beefcake and he had Beefcake legitimately had his face broken from a parasailing accident, had to wear a protective mask, and they took off the mask and they beat on him. And Vince McMahon had a great line on TV, you know, so uh, whoever was color commentating with him, they're like, oh, no, there's blood in the ring. And Vince is like, yeah, I, I, I hope that's not Brutus Beefcake's blood. But it was obvious, you know, th- what they did to him. So they've got this hot, hot match. The main event, in theory, is Bret Hart against Yokozuna. But the match is get, getting the eyeballs is Hogan's match. And they put the belt on Hogan at, at WrestleMania. Bret, Bret Hart loses to Yokozuna. Hogan comes to the ring. And all of a sudden, he's not even, you know advertised in a title match and he's the new WWF champion. A um, little bit of a background, little bit of background that wasn't supposed to happen. The original plan was Hulk Hogan versus Yokozuna at SummerSlam, and my understanding is Vince just kind of—I don't want to call it the panic button—but he kind of said, "No, let's do it now. I don't want to wait any longer." Well, Hulk. It, it was an absolutely awful run. Um, it, it lasted, I want to say, until May or June, and he was gone. It, he didn't draw. He didn't want to be on the road. It was a complete disaster. Um, Hogan, then a year later, WCW signed him, and everyone in the pro wrestling underground is kind of laughing at WCW. They're, we're like, you know, hey, this guy flopped just a year ago in the WWF. They built everything around him. Uh, he was incredibly selfish. He, you know, made Ric Flair look really bad. And but it's now, in hindsight, I do think he should have won Pro Wrestling Illustrated and the Observer's Wrestler of the Year. No, okay. Uh, you know, if I because he has the big machine behind him, I have to give it to him for the uh, for the uh, uh, for the after mag. I, yeah. I have no choice in the matter. I mean, I, I would like to not to. I'm Bret Hart, it, it, for my mind, because right, starting right now, him and Sean are about to keep that operation afloat for about two years. Uh-huh. Pretty all but, you know, with, with some help. But, I mean, it was pretty much them. No, you're right. They were the top two guys, the Undertaker and Cactus Jack, and everyone else really was a step behind. But at least for the one, li- the, the, the Wrestling Observer list, I, the name I'm going to pick, and I'm looking at him right here. Is Art Bar? Wow, I wrestler thought of the Art year. Bar had a crazy good year. I mean, the heat he was generating, the hottest pay per view they had all year was his. Um, that's true. Okay. Yeah. I mean, he was I, he was he was actually expanding the Mexico product. He was so hot down there. I, I, that would be yeah. He would be my choice if I got to pick somebody. And again, I'm not saying this is I did you know. It, I, he wouldn't be the number one guy in a normal year. 
Uh, no, he wouldn't. I mean, anytime I mean, someone asked me, you know, what do you think would have happened with Art Barr had he not died? He would have been a huge star in the 90s, probably for the WWF, if not for WCW. The game was and- coming to him. What's that? The guys forget the game was coming to him. You were looking for now smaller guys, high personality guys, guys who could be you know kind of like in your face kind of heels. You were walking the the whole wrestling business was turning into art bars kind of thing. Yeah. Um. The thing you know, a lot of people will say, oh well, you know, he had that sexual assault thing. I mean, in the you know the wrestling business in the late nineties was going to look right past that, especially the WWF. It wouldn't have mattered, but the reason I think, and again, in hindsight, I would not have said this on January 1st, 1995 Hulk Hogan should have been wrestling observer wrestler of the year, because look at the impact he had. I mean, not only did he bring that whole company up, I believe that had they not had Hulk Hogan, they would have never gotten a primetime television show on TNT. I think it was that simple. They're like, oh, we have Hulk Hogan. Well, we can do that. Had there not been a uh, a Monday Nitro wrestling show, there wouldn't have been a Monday Night Wars, and wrestling might have gone the way of roller derby by this point. Entirely on reputation. That, that would be my disqualify. Entirely on reputation. Entirely. On- absolutely. That's but that's why I can't make him the wrestler of the year, because he's going off. The, he's basically cashing in on something that he did ten years earlier. True, and when WWF brought him back in '93, their their expectation was, hey, the clock was going to roll back and it was going to be 1984 again. No, not even close. And mm-hmm. you know they they wrecked a year of building up Bret Hart as a top guy. They made Bret look weak next to Hulk Hogan. Oh, they kill. Oh, I was about to say this. Brett must have hated these people. Oh, it was so. Uh, this okay. If I have to again, I thought Art had a fantastic year, and that's you know. And this was this was no reputation for him. He just kind of this was his first kind of massive exposure, and he killed it. So I love Art here. But if I got to pick somebody from the North, I'm picking Brett. This was really kind of Brett's, and it was one of those things where he had been building for a couple of years. Mm-hmm. It wasn't part of the machine. Brett was doing this on his own. He got a little help from Gorilla Monsoon occasionally back in the early days, where he kept making a point. I you know mentioning how good Brett was over and over and over again. You know the excellence of execution. But, you know, and I, he must have saw something because he didn't do that with everybody. No, he didn't. Um, but so that helped. But this was one of those kind of a, almost like a dust, not not to this extent, but it was or, organic with him. It just was something. He was something different than what they were throwing out at you. He was. The problem was that. My observation, I didn't feel this way, but I knew people that did, that they saw Brett as just a tag team guy. They saw Shawn Michaels as just a tag team guy. They had been typecast into those roles, and especially at first. I mean, I remember the 1992 Survivor Series. You know, I was watching it with a bunch of casual fans, and they were like, you know, these guys aren't main eventers. I'm like, you know, things change. People, you know, guys get better. A, a guy who might have been a, a, a mediocre baseball player when he was 22 can be the MVP when he's 26. It's the same thing, but people, a lot of people weren't buying it. And just being honest, I mean, Brett did not draw well as champion. Not that it was, you know, all his fault, obviously. There is, this is the, this is like having a, a and by the way, a quick correction. I had said that, uh, I, I have a little bit of a jet lag, so there's going to be a couple of these. I had said that, you know, Art Bar was, you know, I, I thought he was the best, but if I'm going to stay in North America, yes, I do know that, uh, Mexico is in North America. I meant America, actually United States of America. So Los Angeles I, is, in, is in the United States, bro. Well, yeah, but I mean, he was, yeah, but he was a lot, he did a lot of work in Mexico too. Okay. That was that was kind of where he made his name. That was, you know, the LA shows were just more kind of one shot off kind of deal. Terry Funk's an interesting choice here. Well, yeah, he was the legend that e- that ECW, you know, he legitimized a lot of the ECW guys. More importantly, this was not on reputation. He was showing up and working his ass off. Oh yeah. Oh god, Terry, he was in great shape. Yeah, I mean, he was doing I mean, the guys doing moonsaults. At 50. And stuff like, yeah, absolutely. I'm putting him over Hogan on the the the, the uh, observer list. And like I said, but the problem is, it's like a college football season where the national champion has like two losses. I mean, somebody's got to win it, I guess. But everybody, nobody's perfect here. Everybody has flaws right up and down the list. There's no like Ric Flair 1985 here. 
No, they're uh, Kawada. As far as uh, North American wrestlers go, you're correct. Right. I mean, Kawada right. definitely deserved Kawada, it. Of course. Yes. And, you know, it just goes to show you how, how down a year it was. But, I mean, Hogan joining WCW, which was unthinkable at one point, um, really changed the course of wrestling history. Yet he got zero love for 1994 Wrestler of the Year. But check this out. Reader's least favorite wrestler. Hulk Hogan got 370 votes. Second place, Hacksaw Jim Duggan got 32 votes. So you can tell the Observer readership absolutely hated Hulk Hogan. I hated Hulk Hogan in 1994. I can tell you that right now. I mean, I, you know, just him showing up on TV, like, you know, got me steamed up. People came to see him like people go to the, uh, the, the, the old veterans games to see Yogi Berra. They're not going to see Yogi Berra hit a three-run home run. They're going to see Yogi Berra and imagine what it was like when you were a kid. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it, it was like a – that's what it felt like. It felt like an old retirement thing where, you know – and then all of a sudden, once that got over, now what – and now they had a problem because they, he just wasn't capable of getting himself over just newly until they flipped him heel. No, I mean, the, he was not popular with the WCW crowd at all. I mean, if you watch early Nitros before they turned him, I mean, you had people ripping up Hulk Hogan merchandise on camera. He was an oddity. And once the, and, and he got excited, you know, Ole Anderson should have been sitting there like, see, it took me 10 years, but see. Yeah. When he, he's the one who said that if you keep rolling this guy out in town after town after town, he's going to get exposed. Yeah, again, it it took a long, long time, but I mean, this is a case where he just didn't have that charisma to fall back on. He had to actually go and do it, and you know, there you go. This was a bad year for him. I can't even consider him. I mean, what what watchable match did he have all year? Well, that's the thing. Oh, well, anytime he wrestled Flair was at least watchable. And yes, uh, work rate counts in the Wrestling Observer. I do get that. I have not forgotten that. I just think you know his his impact. Was, was beyond dramatic. Like I said, I really think that if, if WCW had not signed Hogan, there never would have been a, a Monday Night War. And right now, I don't think there would be WWE Network. I think it would it, wrestling would have gone not extinct, but it wouldn't have, would have never gotten to the heights that it got, that it got to. And that it remains today. Then, then call him the most inspirational or something. Because if you're going to be the wrestler you, you're actually, you actually have to wrestle at some point. And, you yeah. know, unless it was in there with somebody who was just otherworldly, like Flair, who can drag anybody to a, you know, three to four star match. He was, you know, those Brutus Beefcake tag team matches were great. I mean, just it was just bad all around. Unless <laughs> he had somebody in there who could carry him. It was a, it was a just bad year. He should not even be in any of these discussions, except for the except for the aftermag one. But, I mean, he, he wins that by accident just because of the way it's going to be pushed. He has to win that. Oh, sure. I, I mean, well, first of all, the after mags uh, still were very anti Vince McMahon at this point. But I mean, look at it from an after mag, mag perspective. I mean, Hogan base. I mean, we're pretending it's a real sport now. OK, Hogan yeah. comes to WCW and dominates. I mean, who else could it possibly be? The WWF, you know, they had Bret Hart and Ric Flair. Or, uh, excuse me, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels at the top of their cards. But they weren't dominant like Hogan was in WCW. And again, that's a Hogan ego thing, obviously. Obviously, we're looking at it from two completely different perspectives. This is what I'm saying. You have no choice but to give it to him in that category for after. But he should not even be in the uh, wrestling. I, they didn't always get this right. But in this case, they did. He should not have been on the list. He's not. He, no. he, even Shane, Shane Douglas got more votes than he did. Well, Ugh. like I said, it was it was uh, 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 basically a culture that absolutely hated Hulk Hogan. They didn't want to hear it. Uh, I didn't want to hear it at the time. I mean, like I said, he was, you know, I think like 90 percent of the ballots, it looked like looks like had him as least favorite wrestler. Nine out of ten. That's incredible. This is a straight out. I, I don't see if you're a wrestling uh, executive, you look at this and you take away anything other than, ooh, they're mad. I mean, Sabu's not, Sabu's not getting 123 first place votes because he's brilliant. He's getting 123 first place votes because he's not in one of the two. 
You know what, though? If you're a wrestling executive, you say, okay, this newsletter and it's true. It's for the hardcore obsessed fan, and that's not who we're after because we've already got you. We are looking for people who are non-wrestling fans to start watching our programming and then start buying tickets, start buying pay-per-views, start buying merchandise, etc. That stopped working a while ago. I, I mean, don't like, know. What, what, how, much, how much money did WCW lose in 93? I honestly don't know. From what I understand, their accounting methods were really messed up. They weren't uh, giving the they weren't giving uh, the TV revenue its proper due. It was a lot. It was a lot. So I mean, the, the, it's not like they're sitting there. Oh, who needs these hardcore guys? I don't know what they're talking about. We're fine. No, you're hurting. So I'd be looking around trying to figure out what we could do to possibly fix something. I'm not saying to steal everything you're doing. Well, unless you're Jeff Rodman, of course, you can take his, you know, his his wise words. Um, but uh, I mean, outside of you know, you but you have to sit there and look what is wrong. And if you're doing that, I'd be looking anywhere. And this is again where sometimes wrestling promoters' arrogance kind of you know gets the best of them, where they have to insist that they're right and they're not looking at outside opinions. Uh, but Sean, I got to disagree with you and I'll tell you why. Mm-hmm. And once again, they signed Hogan. They signed him to a contract which was considered outrageous at the time. He was getting, I think he was the best paid wrestler in North America. He was working a very limited dates. He was not on the road at all. I mean, he was not doing house shows. He got like a $25,000 bonus every time he did a pay-per-view. But at the end of the day, it turned out he was worth every penny because that's what got WCW rolling. I mean, do you think they would have gotten a primetime television show without Hulk Hogan? He may have. Okay, I will give you that. Was he worth the money as far as what he gave to the business? Okay, I guess. But again, you were not buying the guy. Him coming back was kind of like, say, Buddy Rogers when he came back to like Mid Atlantic and Florida. It was for like a couple months. He came back, lived out the reputation, popped the house good, and then all of a sudden you actually have to perform. At one point, that is going to wear off eventually, and you have to perform. And at that point, Buddy, I mean, Buddy's what, 50, whatever? You just can't go anymore. And that, Hogan just really could not go anymore. He needed, and he certainly couldn't do it with that persona. Well, no, he couldn't. You know, one of my least favorite matches of all time was the 2002 match between The Rock and Hulk Hogan at WrestleMania. Um, I mean, Hogan couldn't do a damn thing, but the place went wild. I mean, he could do not what he needed to do to make the Observer readership happy, but he had 60-something thousand fans in Toronto. He made them happy. And that, and, and this is this is eight years later. Who all remember Hogan running down the uh, the um, the aisle in MSG with the headband halfway across his face, pointing up in the air? There's the sheet. Go, you know, that's what it is. I mean, it was like a, it's it's a reunion show. It's like seeing the Who, you know, you know, and, you know whatever, not the Who. They're still pretty good, but I mean, it's like seeing pick a band, some some hair band from the '80s today. You know, you're you're going to relive you know something that happened years ago. But again, you still at that point that is going to wear off. You still have to be able to pull out a decent match and actually be a, have a compelling product today, not just hoping fans are going to remember how good you were ten years ago. But that's or, my exact point. When you put on a concert, you're you're in the business of drawing money, and this coming summer, my understanding is Def Leppard, Poison, and some other metal band are getting together and doing like an all day stadium show. And they expect those, those shows a to sell out and B the tickets are ranging between $200 for good tickets. Okay. And $80 for like nosebleed seats. I mean, that's the perfect analogy. Maybe, you know, the guitarist for Def Leppard is nowhere near as good as he was 30 years ago, but he's drawing money. And I don't think people, are going to go home. They're going to go. You're going to send the people home happy. Yeah, you you can't run out. You, yeah, you can do that occasionally. You can do that for tours. You can do that every couple of years. You, it's you know you're not going to draw huge doing that night in and night out. It's he. It just was. Oh, and one other problem. How much smaller was he? It was like someone put him in a dryer. Oh yeah, he How was. Much- I mean, he was in good shape for a guy in his forties, but he was. You know, obviously, he wasn't what he was in 1985. But that's part. Of, that was part of his mystique, yeah. is that he was just this superhuman, you know, the Incredible Hulk Hogan. So much now, all of a sudden, most of the roster is bigger than he is. 
Oh, sure, but they're not Hulk Hogan. That's the whole point. I know, but that's part. that was part of the act. I'm not saying that's all of it. He still has the amazing charisma, but that kind of larger-than-life thing that he did physically has now been taken away. I, I, I wasn't, you know, it was something that jumped out at me when he came back. I was like, wow, that's... Yeah. That's different. I mean, all of a sudden, those straight power moves don't look as impressive anymore. No, I mean, Vince had a serious problem. I mean, he had the ultimate warrior wrestling in a T-shirt like the fat kid at the pool, for God's sake. But one thing I want to bring up before we move on from wrestler of the year, and Sean, I'm going to let you pick the next category we, we talk about. I mean, Ole Anderson, both uh, out loud and in his book, talked about how Hulk Hogan wasn't going to draw in Georgia in 1989, 79, excuse me, because, well, a guy like that who can't work will never draw anyway. Well, first of all, you, you got proven wrong, Ole, okay? I mean, admit it. That's number one. Number two, if he wasn't going to draw, why did you put so much TV time into him? And number three, don't act like everyone in Georgia could work but Hulk Hogan. I mean, that, that's ridiculous. Abdullah the Butcher was a regular there. Uh, Tony Atlas was a regular there. Uh, I mean, they, there were so many guys who just stunk in Georgia, but they were out there every week. So, you know, that's just not true. I was sitting sick and I mentioned all. Just, I'm sitting there in my head like that old sitcom bitch. When someone walks away, you're like, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. It, it took a little longer than I thought, but uh, this one's an easy one for me. And there's plenty to complain about. All 94 right. Tag Team of the Year. Okay. Tag Team of the Year. Let me scroll down. Now, who would you pick for Observer Tag Team of the Year? I think they got it right. No question about it. Love Machine and Eddie Guerrero. I mean, they I were they were amazing. Uh, Los Gringos Locos, you had Conan kind of glomming onto them. You know, everyone was – you know someone's hot when you have everyone kind of trying to gravitate toward them, especially the stars. Check this out. Uh, Love Machine and Eddie Guerrero, 2,568 points. Next team down, Misawa and Kabashi, 900 and, 926 votes. They got – almost four times as many first place votes as the number two team. I mean, it's, and, and then I, I don't know if there should have been that big of a difference between those two teams, but those are your top two. And then once you get past the top two, don't look down because you got a bit of a cliff coming. Oh, I disagree with you. Oh, stop. Please don't tell me you're going to defend these guys. Uh, I'm not going to defend these guys. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, I misunderstood what you were doing because there are still some good tag teams here. But no, yeah, yeah, three. yeah. Okay. I'll let you nope. do it. Who was number three? Number three is Paul E. Dangerously's, as a booker's, crowning achievement, along with that tag team match with the Pitbulls and Richards and, um, and Raven. Public Enemy. When Public Enemy left... Paul must have laughed his ass off sitting there thinking, oh, my God, how much did they pay you? <laughs> OK, without me running this, let's see how this works. And I didn't I, I mean, it was it just it, it was over the second. I mean, they, it just never worked anywhere else. It, they were a completely a creation of Paul. And it was one of those. And he did this in like 94, 95. He did this a few times. He did this with the Dudleys. Where he would just take something that just could can't possibly work, and he would make it work. And then once you get them away from him, it would fall apart. This is the cover children for this. These are the cover children for this. Oh yeah, I mean ECW. I mean they were ECW was the hero of the sheets in 1994, and Sabu number two wrestler of the year and Public Enemy number three tag team of the year proves that. I spoke. What? Let me say this: one of my greatest regrets as a wrestling fan is never getting in the car, or hopping on Amtrak, whatever, and going to Philadelphia uh, to during their glory years to see ECW. I mean, just to be part of the experience. It's just to have done it once. Uh, I wish I had, and I didn't. But I mean, supposedly, I mean, Public Enemy was over like crazy oh, with oh, that. Oh, make crowd. no mistake. Yeah, no, make no mistake about it. But I'm just making the reference to the fact that they were over with that crowd because Paul E used them so brilliantly. I mean, it was perfect the way he used it. I mean, he put, I, I keep remembering the line he used in one of the documentaries where it said, I'm not going to try to outdo the WWF or WCW. Unfortunately, he, that's exactly what he tried to do, and that ended up being his downfall. But he said, I'm, I have negatives, and I have positives. I'm going to accentuate the positives and hide the negatives. And mm -hmm. then it was almost like the next shot was P.E. 
Well, I mean, it was it was the, uh, he used them so perfectly. That it was, uh, but you can't. I, I uh, they were over, and I feel more comfortable giving them the award with after than I do here because they were terrible. You know, I used to watch public enemy matches and I'd be like, wow, that was a really good match. Oh, my God. And then I would learn that I just watched five minutes of a 25 minute match and there were just there was just a lot of garbage in that 20 minutes that they cut out. But that's my point. They created the illusion that public enemy was this great tag team. Yep. Yep, and that was Paul's genius. He, they, they guys were world beaters. How do you think Eric must have? I just to see the look on Eric's face. It must have been the same as Vince when Sweet Hansen walked in. You know, or no, no, I'm sorry, it was Ox Baker walked in. Like, oh my God, get him out of here. What? What did we just pay for these two? I mean, because they never really did anything. I mean, they gave him the titles, but I mean, did they ever get past mid card? No, they didn't. As a matter of fact, I remember uh, their debut on Nitro, where you know a lot of people were happy. I mean, these guys give them credit; they they paid their dues in the business. My God, oh, uh, Ted oh, yeah, Teddy's yeah. as the Cheetah Kid working indies th- during the eighties. But I mean, yeah. So I'm glad they finally got a payday. But I mean, oh, I remember yeah, their I'm debut saying, on yeah. on Nitro. I'm, they were just awful. I'm just saying they outpunted their coverage here. Yeah. And yeah. you know what? I mean, in a way, that's that's what you're supposed to do as a wrestling promoter. You are Absolutely. supposed to create that illusion. One other team here I'd like to mention who um, who's had a nice stretch here was uh, Dan Crawford and Doug Furness. Yeah, they primarily wrestled in Japan. Um, and when they fir- finally got to the WWF in 96, it looked like they lost something. I mean, I remember... Um, I think it would. They got into a really bad car accident, and Furnace got messed up, and he wasn't the same after that. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at the um, the after list. Uh, is the top three teams the worst top three teams ever in the history of this category for this magazine? Oh, they might be. You know, the Nasty Boys talking about they had that match against the Steiners at Halloween Havoc '90, where I mean, it was it was a match. They just all four guys just beat the crap out of each other and everyone came away saying wow the nasty boys are good no the nasty boys are good at giving out and taking hard shots that's all they were good all they were good for and they made so much money on that night you get the head shrinkers is the first runner up oh this is how bad things were in the wwf it's, it's, seriously second runner up is public enemy you know what that's where they should be yeah, that's how bad this product was this year. That for the way that the, the way that category is, PE was dominant. PE was the number one thing that they had going in '94. And I again, I'm picking on them, but it worked. But you were absolutely correct though that that's what they did. You would get five minutes. It is the same thing they do with Sandman. You would get yeah. like three minutes of a Sandman match. It went on for like 19 minutes, and the rest of it was hell. Same with Sabu. Same and, with Sabu. I was just about to say. And, you know, because if you, I, I remember seeing a couple of his, you know, pay-per-view. And when I saw him live, oh, the missed spots were unbelievable. He, you would have, you have like a 40-minute match with five minutes of wrestling. It's just him setting stuff up. It's like <laughs> a construction work. It was painful. Oh, I, I'm still bitter about that. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just unbelievable. There are some good teams here, but the way that it's, it's striking about – you had to pick these teams because they were the guys who were over. But you're seeing – this is my problem. Look who they're pushing. Well, yeah, they, they push the guys that were, were – we're talking ECW now, right? Yeah, I mean because like, not, not ECW. You have the Nasty Boys getting pushed. Okay, you have yeah, the they, Headstrakers getting pushed. Yeah, Nasty Boys <laughs> signed a big contract in 1993 with WCW, which made no sense. Rock and Roll Express and the Heavenly Bodies must be looking around like, what the hell do we have to do? I was going to say, I, when you said, oh, you, we fall off a cliff here, I'm like, wait a minute. The Heavenly Bodies and the Rock yeah. and Roll Express were still really good in 1994. Oh, I, this is my this, – is this the version with uh, um, um, Jimmy Del Rey? Th- yes, it was. I think this Stan is Lane version. left like the beginning of either late 83 or early 84. When Stan was there, it felt like a revamped Midnight Express. That's when what they it brought, was. When they brought Jimmy in, they became their own team. It became Doc's team, and Jimmy settled into that spot, and they really started working nicely here. Uh, outside of if I have to pick an, you know, if I have to pick an American team, uh, meaning United States of, uh, I'm picking the Heavenly Bodies. I think. 
I would pick the Heavenly Bodies as well. I think one of the most embarrassing moments in wrestling history was in 1993 when the Rock and Rolls and Heavenly Bodies wrestled at the Survivor Series. We're looking at easily two of the top teams of the business, maybe the top top two teams in the United States, and the fans just didn't want to see it. They just weren't interested. It was it was a sad moment. Who were the Hellraisers? Uh, I hated the Hellraisers. It was Road Warrior Hawk, and I don't remember. I couldn't stand this tag team. They absolutely yeah. were terrible. I have no idea how anyone voted for them. I'm trying to remember who the other guy was, and I can't. I'm just, I'm just like, oh my, I, I have never. Did I just like force this out of my brain? To, to make it never because I had no – usually there's like a trick. I'm like, okay, I kind of remember him from something. No recollection whatsoever of this. So, I mean, that's – and they're here for some – where were they? Um, Let me think. It was Road Warrior Hawk who by this point were, were, were absolutely terrible. And oh, yeah. Kensu, Kensuke Sasaki. What did he I, do? I, yeah, because Hawk, Hawk is bad at this point. You know, Hawk is really bad, and Sasaki is acting like he's another road warrior, just not selling and being an ass. I couldn't stand that tag team. And, well, uh, they got votes. <laughs> I don't know why. I oh. really don't don't know why. They were absolutely terrible. Another team that was not good by 1994, living off their reputation, was number nine, Rick and Scott Steiner. Yeah, and they would for a couple of years. They got a little bit better when they uh, when the Nitro era started and the war started. But I mean, and they could still pop a crowd. But you're right; it really, you know, they were kind of going back to the same stuff. And yeah, the thing, you know, what it was, you always kind of expected Scott to go off on his own. So you're kind of just waiting for that to happen. It never did. No, I mean, he he looked like he was going to. He kind of did when he turned heel and he showed up on Nitro with that new hairstyle. That kind of blew me away. But, yeah, Scott never – I mean, I thought Scott was going to be a huge deal in pro wrestling. Um, we're, we're talking, you know, maybe the next Hogan at one point I was thinking about oh, wow. him, like 89, 90, and it just never happened. No, I, the stuff he was doing – when he first got in, was un, it was unheard of. It, it, I never seen any of this stuff. The guy was freakish. Yeah, and I, yeah. He could fly around, and he was, you know, I mean, built like Road Warrior Hawk. And that was the problem with Scott Steiner. He decided that he wanted to be Road Warrior Hawk instead of being Jack Briscoe. Yeah, yeah, true. So, okay, you're up. What category? Best on interviews. Best on interviews. Yeah. Okay. Number one is Ric Flair, which I totally disagreed with. I think Rick, he, he was living on his reputation interview-wise by 1994. Some, I mean, as a matter of fact, 93, I would have voted Rick worst on interviews. Now, hear me out. They would just shove Ric Flair out w there with nothing to talk about, and he stunk. As a matter of fact, this when Nitro first started, Rick would be on, and he'd have nothing to talk about. It would just be like, woo, mean Gene, whoa, and he'd strut around. And then he'd leave, and I'd be like, you know, that was awful. And I think 89, 88, 87, every year before that, Rick was best on interviews. But, he, I mean, he kind of felt it felt quickly. They finally broke him, I think. Yeah, <laughs> it was, just, it was so many years, I think they finally broke him. And he's just coming. He's like, you know what? They're going to give me the guaranteeing contract. They're, they're going to screw with me anyway. They're going to have me lose to Hogan 7,000 times. Whatever. You know, is this how it's going to be? This is how it's going to be. And this ended up infecting, not starting with him, but everyone ended up doing it. I was going to say, I mean, he wasn't the first one to just say, okay, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to take the check and go home. And get out of here. Who's two? Shane Douglas. Why? The cult of ECW returns. Now we have Sabu, number two best wrestler. We have Shane, number two best interview. I blew his knee to obliterate. Yeah, that was that was Shane's great line from 1994. Uh, no, Shane was the all his promos sounded very oh it's like it feels like he wrote it before. Like I can still see him, he was doing that bit. And he he has that one moment where he kind of looks up and goes, "This is it, Dad." Oh and yeah. Like, and you're like, ah, oh, you know, I you know, if that if that had like a genuineness to it, that could have been effective, but it didn't, so it just made it look worse. I, 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 can't, I can't think of a good Shane promo. Uh, at least maybe later on a little bit. He got a little, but now, no. 
I liked Shane, Shane's promos for the most part in 1994 because they were different. They seemed authentic. They, he, he did things that were way uh, different. You know, like he's talking about Ric Flair all the time. He talked about Ric Flair too much, but he talked about a guy who worked for another company. He had the audacity to tear down Ric Flair, who Dick was Flair. the... Yeah, who, who was an icon amongst the hardcore fans, and he was seen as a rebel for doing it. So it was a, a calculated risk that worked. Um, at times, it got way obnoxious. I mean, re- once again, you know, you're talking about Ric Flair. He doesn't even work here. You know, think about drawing money, Shane. And he had that one infamous promo that went on for like 20, 25 minutes. And it, it was just, you know, it was too long. Obviously, no one can do a promo for 20, 25 minutes. Shane is the innovator of the 25-minute Raw intro, uh, in, in a interview to start the show. He was he was the guy who would come to the ring. And by the way, this is another one who goes under the Paulie, you know, uh, taking care of him on TV because these promos would go on forever. He, he would go on into the middle of the ring. It was painful. It just was everything was. No, he would. He was not a good promo guy. He was a good promo guy after Paul cut him, cut him down a little bit. Yeah. And even then, he wasn't great. Um, uh, now, I, I mean, there's a couple. Of, OK, three is a number. Obvious choice, but here's a couple uh, that are down a little bit that I thought were kind of up and coming. Well, one is Cactus Jack. Cactus Jack's interviews were awesome, especially in ECW, especially during this period. I think I, you know what? I would have gone Cactus Jack number one. I think his better interviews would come in like in ECW. Would- be in the beginning in 95, but he was still tremendous here. Um, and another one is Bob Backlund. You see, I did not like the Bob Backlund 1994 character. Did not like it at all. Oh, I did. Yeah, you see, I mean, you know, reasonable people can see things differently, but I sure. hated the whole thing. But it made sense to me. I could see Bob finally snapping after you know, losing his title. Ten years later, he's waiting for the next cup. It just made sense. It was like, okay, I could actually see Bob just kind of flipping out and just going off the deep end. It, I don't know, for some reason, that kind of that character and the way he was and the way the business changed, it was kind of like the revenge of old school. <laughs> ah, I, I, I did not like it. What can I say? I, uh, one guy work. we skipped over who did awesome interviews in 1994 was Paulie Dangerously. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, he, Paul was still – yeah, Paul didn't get – later on, Paul's promos with ECW would get bad for the same reason they were bad with Shane because he would start doing the Shane thing where he'd go in the middle of the ring and we'd have like the 45-minute deal. Um, but at this point, yeah, he was, he was keeping it tighter than usual. You know, for the sake of the show, I took a, a look at some ECW from 1994, and, I mean, you want to talk about just – it was so poorly produced to the point where I enjoyed the poor production. Like, Paulie would do an interview backstage – I don't know where he was in real life, but supposedly he was backstage, and he'd be in front of this white door that said – it had a, a a piece of paper taped to it that said, no press allowed, exclamation point, exclamation point. And he, he did some really good stuff. And, and eventually everyone knew that, you know, hey, he's not just a manager. He owns this thing. And he had to kind of not take himself off television, but stop being a manager. He – they would – that was – you're absolutely right. That was part of the charm of the show. And I remember one where they were trying – they had this bit where they were pushing Mikey whip wreck and they were using um, it was a funny bit where they were using public enemy to train him, which, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Uh, so, uh, and it looked like they were having him train at a, at a grade school gym set outside in the middle of the night. And you just <laughs> look at this, like who, 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 whose idea was this? And it was, it was, it was almost like watching clerks, you know, the old movie with Kevin Smith. I it's do. Just like, my, my God, how does he do this? With like you know, it, it's like it's just a miracle they could do it at all. I mean, you know what? I guarantee you, Paulie watched whatever Paulie watched or whatever he read. I'm sure like bled into his wrestling because I mean, Public Enemy they would have they would have fit it right in as background characters and clerks. <laughs> I can see. That. There's two customers row? walking yeah. into that store, you know, grazing hell, whatever. <laughs> but it's the the way he uses what, but the the um the the thing with clerks is. 
is that again low production and you have to use a very tiny space so you have to come up with all these funny like ways to hide the things you can't do and that's really what paul was doing the whole time he was i, I you know i i mentioned i watched some ecw i watched a, a paul public enemy do an interview and my god the, i mean their interviews i thought were terrible i have no idea how they even placed here i mean i know like once again the newsletters were you know uh, it was part the newsletters readers were part of the whole ECW cult thing. But I mean, you don't have to vote for public enemy, vote for Paul Lee, vote, vote for Shane, for God's sake, vote for Cactus oh. Jack. Oh, I'll tell you why public enemy is here because all the only interviews most of the people saw for public enemy were, you know, quick clip of Rocco, quick clip of Johnny, quick clip of Rocco, uh, show something in the ring, go away. So the whole interview time was seven seconds. And even Public Enemy can manage to be interesting for seven seconds. Uh, I'll tell you what. Maybe I got unlucky, but the two two of the shows I watch had them doing long interviews, and they were just you know, it was it was like when, it was bad comedy. When when were they? Uh, let me see. This was right before uh, November to Remember, and the you know the usual thing where they're outside in a bad neighborhood, you know, yeah. doing this interview like Johnny. I can't believe it, Johnny. Yeah. The other guy would just mock the other, you know repeat what the oh, other yeah. guy said i hated it it was a it, it, it was an ironic thing though that was again this went into the part of the deal it, they weren't good we knew they weren't good and that's when that why when they went to wcw it was almost like part of the joke it was like the thing when andy kaufman would do the great elvis impersonation and then if you can't but he would do 50 bad impersonations first so you right. think the show was terrible then he'd roll out elvis now people would come back to see the show just for the joke because you get to watch it everyone else ecw fans are watching wcw the same way we're like oh here goes public enemy oh this is gonna be good how are they get they're gonna push them seriously because they never really pushed them quote seriously in ecw they were taught they were kind of the joke kind of funny you know they were never like these bad guys i saw them walk out with the table and wave i was like oh no they're gonna play these guys straight and they did and it was a disaster yeah, in, in ECW, I don't think they were really pushed as a joke. They were pushed as like you know the hardcore oh, tough guys from oh, the street. No, who... no, 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 no. Uh, yeah, they that too, and they were just crazy and you know. But the the yeah, every look, just look at the the uh, the whip promos where they're just it, they're openly making fun of themselves. So I mean, and because ECW, the, the, the fans weren't uh, they got annoying, but they they weren't dumb. So I mean, if you're watching something of some quality, you, they're gonna know. What's good and what's bad. We we got the public enemy joke, but you know, second he went, but they tried to play it much more seriously. Okay, they did for the violent part of it, but it was never kind of a this is a great tag team. It was like the Dudleys when you brought the Dudleys over to uh, WWF. They're like, oh, this is you know, twelve time champions. I don't never remember yeah, until the very end when they had nothing else that the Dudleys were considered a great great team. The part, the part with uh, like public enemy, uh, uh, J.T. Smith. You remember him? Uh huh. The Cardinals receiver example. or the wrestler? Just I mean, <laughs> yeah, that just exactly. him once. That was another one of the jokes where it, it almost had like a, a an over the top comical feel to it. And until I, it's like I would say it started with uh, Dreamer and Raven, where the violence started to get more and more serious. Mm -hmm. And that's when it started. You know, that's when that situation that Jim Cornette talks about, where. You, you know, you wanted to make it look violent, you know, back in the day where it wasn't. But now it's the opposite yes. where, you know, you, that's where they started to happen. But that how it, that's not how it was at the beginning. It was they kind of treated it almost as, as you were saying, because these guys really couldn't work. So they wouldn't have all these train wreck matches. They would just have them with public enemy. So but another another glorious list. One question for you. I don't need to go over this whole category, but I. Um, I'm looking at the most obnoxious list, which is a very, you know, I don't know how you would actually grade that, but one of your friends is here, which I think is a vast injustice. What the, what the hell did poor Dennis Coraluza did? He, he got screwed. The once again, uh, ECW fans were were very hardcore. They were into newsletters, and things got very personal between the ECW promotion itself and Dennis Coraluzo. There was real life heat, and I'm sure that was just their way of of striking out against an enemy of ECW. Uh, I'm sure it did not bother Dennis. Ah, uh, just. Wrong. Yo, man, look okay. at this, man. Fucking most obnoxious. I should have been fucking higher, man. I'm like, I don't want to do this whole category, but I have got to bring that up. 
Uh, okay, so we have time for one more category, and I will say... Oh, I can't find this. I was looking for the match of the year, but I can't find it. Um, well, how about we go with the uh, feud of the year? Okay. 1994 feud of the year for the W um, for the Wrestling Observer. We have uh, what in my mind is the obvious winner, uh, Los Gre- uh, the uh, Bar and uh, Art Bar and Eddie Guerrero against uh, AAA. Uh, I, I actually, I like their list here. Bret Hart, Owen Hart, I thought was well done. I know the brother feud doesn't usually work, but this they this felt like there was something they were working off of. You know, that there was something down deep that kind of competitive thing between the two of them where it was kind of coming out it felt real more real than these usually do um yeah i mean i i like the feud i watched a lot of AAA in 1994 i mean refresh my memory are they against the whole promotion or is that a faction um i i think it was a kind of like a growing faction Okay, I think it looks like uh, it looks like Guerrero and Barr against the entire promotion, which kind of uh, I don't know. Well, I it was it, more of a it, well, obviously it wasn't everywhere at the same time, but I mean it was it ended up being them against. No, it's not the exact correlation. I'm, I'm going to end up saying something wrong because it was so many years ago, but kind of like you know like R- Ricky Chosu was doing. It was just a revolt against the whole system. You know, uh, when he had the, the Chosu's army, you know, this was just those two. And I think uh, Conan was got involved in it with them at some point, too. All right. I, I mean, I can see it. I just don't see that. As, I see that more as an, as an angle as a feud. But here they are at number one. So who am I to argue? I'm going to vote for anything that involves Art Bar this year. This was the Art Bar year, the Eddie Guerrero year. They were awesome. Yeah, Eddie you know, Art Bar would have been a huge star in pro wrestling, just like Eddie Guerrero was. There's no question in my mind. And for the one list, we have um, we'll go with the the United States, and we have Hogan and Flair, number two. <laughs> I I did not like that feud for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, it, it it held it had an impact on WCW as we talked about. Uh, I personally would have gone with Bret Hart and Owen Hart as Feud of the Year. Um, and let's see, it's uh, Sandman versus Dreamer, which was better than it sounds. Oh, Ramon another... and Michaels was ahead of that. Oh, that absolutely, was, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a good feud, and obviously they had the best the best U.S. match in my opinion at WrestleMania when they did the ladder match, and uh, I remember reading the observer and Dave saying that, yep, every indie promotion is going to be using ladder matches all summer long. And he was absolutely right. That match doesn't age. Well, really? I, I watched I it a couple know. of years ago and I thought, I still thought it was really good. It, 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 it feels like a spot fest. It doesn't feel like it has any kind of fluidity to it. It feels like the difference of the, um, Shawn Michaels, hell in the cell match and cactus Jack's hell in the cell match. Hmm. Shawn Michaels is starting in like 93 started going way over the top with his bumps. Uh, they didn't look realistic. Um, you know, he, he just, I mean, go watch the opening match of WrestleMania nine. I mean, I remember the first time I saw that, I, I just couldn't believe the stuff he was doing. It was like, you know, I mean, some people liked it. I didn't, it, no. just, it was just so, so over the top. This is when they're starting to take the violence seriously. But, uh, okay, yes. I went to Sam Man because I was desperately trying to avoid 8-9. and nine. Um, Sabu. And Sabu is here basically because of the outstanding skill of Terry Funk. And now, where would Cactus – where would that have taken place? I know they had some ECW, but they were going at it in other places too. Where else yeah. was you were getting Sabu and Cactus Jack? Uh, I know they had a match in Michigan. Uh, I don't remember if Funk – they had a match in Los Angeles. Uh, but mostly it was, it was an ECW feud. But this was like an indie dream because this had been going before ECW. Paul brought them in, and they had already met a couple times, I believe. Um, f- you're talking Funk and Sabu, probably. Well, I know I meant Sabu and Cactus. Ah, uh, no, I don't think really? they they had, they had wrestled before. As a matter of fact, once again, talk about the cult of ECW. Cactus Jack versus Sabu was seen as a dream match in 1994, and no, I'm not exaggerating. I know that sounds absolutely insane right now, but it is the truth. <sighs> yes, it was. So, okay, now to ten, and I, I, I like, I like this. The guys, again, this is another Pauly miracle. And uh, Tommy Dreamer, if you don't know Tommy Dreamer then, is not Tommy Dreamer now. 
Tommy Dreamer then used to wear almost like this Chippendales outfit. Yes. And he was a pretty boy, and he could not. Now, he had milked this for years afterwards, so it got lame later on. But at the time, it was really interesting. And yeah. it was basically him trying to prove himself to the EC. W fans, and he was going to go through Sandman, who at this point was just considered a you know just a wild man. Um, and it, it just the matches again were terrible. But if Paul cuts them up to like two minutes, but the 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 people were compelling because Paul had a great talent of putting people into situations, at least at this time, where they really their own personality was able to come out and fill out like what was going on. And it made it feel real. Yeah, Paulie liked Tommy Dreamer, um, and supposedly he was like a really tough guy in real life. Um, it, you know, and he got him away from the. You're right. He was like a pretty boy dressed in suspenders and all that good stuff. And they had a feud with him and Sandman, and they had something known as a Singapore Cane match. Now this is Paulie at his craziest. There was an international incident where some kid from the United States was going to be – he was in Singapore, and he, he committed a crime, and they were going to take a cane to his back, and it was a really big deal. It was like, you know, no, Singapore, you can't torture our citizens. The punishment doesn't fit the crime, and, and Paul, he turns that into a wrestling match. Well, Dreamer loses. And can't, Sandman absolutely beats the crap out of him with the cane. The shots were brutal. And you had woman on the side mocking Tommy Dreamer, and he just continued to take the punishment. And wow, everyone respects him after that. And you know he what? Was, Paulie, got, Paulie got his money's worth out of Tommy Dreamer. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, and vice versa, by, by the way. Oh, yeah. Uh, to, yeah, no, Tommy took a big boy beating here. He, his back was bleeding. I mean, this was like. Uh, this was there were you could see the blood stripes on his back. Sandman wheeled the hell out of him. And I guarantee you, Tommy's like, you let it go ahead of time. Sandman's like, do you understand what you're saying? And he's like, no, no, no. I was like, all right. And you know, that's I mean, and it got him over though. That got it, that was the start. And uh they have one more Sandman feud here. And the only thing I remember about it is the the famous catchphrase, pay your debts, Tommy. <laughs> uh, Sam and Tommy Carroll. One other thing to keep in mind how influential ECW was, there was no such thing as a Singapore cane before ECW. It was a kendo no. stick. That phrase no, no is one in the, would have done that. That phrase is in the lexicon because of ECW. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, like I said, it was, it was a crazy promotion doing crazy stuff, and people were eating it up because they were so frustrated with WWF and, and WCW. Um one other feud I want to throw out there. This was a really good feud, Ricky Steamboat and Steve Austin. And it's not looking back, wow, those were two of my favorite wrestlers. Like in 94, their feud was interesting, and they had good matches. Steve was tremendous. In ring. Later on, you would have to develop what was kind of known as the WWF main event style, which is the matches that you know Steve of later on. And that's just because of injuries. Uh, he just could not do later on what he was going to going to be doing here against Steamboat. He was absolutely fantastic at this point. It, it, everything was very crisp. He, everything looked damaging. Yeah. As opposed to later on where he would do stuff that didn't look quite as bad. This stuff, he, it, it was a snap. There was a pop to everything he was doing. He was just top shelf and Ricky's Ricky. Oh yeah. I mean, Rick, Ricky's pulling up four star matches against Chris Jericho 20 years later. <laughs> yeah, Ricky. He's, he's, you know, I'm gonna, he, Ricky is one of the greatest of all time in the ring. He worked a little bit light, but that's okay. I am going to wrap up this show with my my Steve Austin confession. When he was in World Class in like eighty nine ninety, I was like, this guy is going to be a big star. Look out! WCW signed him, and by this point, I'm like, ah, eh, he just doesn't have it. He's going to be a middle of the card, a talented middle of the card guy for the rest of his life then he went to ecw in 95 and i felt like an idiot it was obvious that being in wcw he was being held back and once he was allowed to get out there and do whatever he wanted i'm like there's the steve austin i thought was going to be a star obviously i didn't think he was going to be the biggest star of all time but we're wrapping it up this is the last stick to wrestling before the holiday season really kicks in i want to wish everyone a happy holiday um 
I want to thank Sean Goodwin for everyone he does. Have a safe and happy and safe holiday. No drinking and driving. If you drink and drive, you're too dumb to listen to this show. Don't do it. Uh, I want to thank Lou Kippelman, our producer, for keeping this show. He does a lot behind the scenes to make us sound good. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Take care, everyone. Go Vols. Beat Indiana.